Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are diving into dark history, legends, and hauntings of the Queen City of the Ozarks, Springfield, Missouri, and there's a lot to cover. We'll get back to that in a minute, but first we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, or just about any other podcast platform you use. So what is scary about Springfield's past? Well, there's a lot to cover in the dark tales of Springfield. The Queen City fits well in the noir genre. From murder to war to hauntings, we actually may be talking about Springfield in more than one episode. And that's even before we get to legends about vampires in the tunnels beneath downtown or the albino farm. There have been a lot of things happen in Springfield that was very dark and some that are hard to explain. And of course, it's up to everyone to decide what really happened in some cases. We will discuss what you thought was merely the largest city in the southern Missouri Ozarks. But first, we want to invite everyone to like, follow, etc. Dark Ozarks on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Plus, we encourage you to follow the podcast. While you're on Facebook, you can subscribe to the private Dark Ozarks subscribers group. Why, you may ask? Yes, it does have a small subscription fee, but you receive exclusive content and behind the scenes info that you don't find anywhere else. It also helps us bring more original content to Dark Ozarks. You can click the subscribe button on the page. You will have to log in uh, because there's a payment. We do appreciate everyone. And now you can get Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at darkozarks.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage everyone to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and their website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com, for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more, not to mention the building's haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English style brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and great food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, this building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. Speaking of noir past, uh, Springfield's noir past started pretty early. (laughs) It does start early. Just to frame this a little bit, the city of Springfield was incorporated officially in 1838. Uh, There were settlers transitioning into the of what is now downtown as early as around 1830. But <clears throat> even well before that, uh, there were Native American groups in the, in the immediate region. Of course, the Osage uh, for a very long time. And uh, then the Kickapoo and the Del- Delaware, among others, were, ha- had direct interaction with the space, um, mainly <clears throat> either in the case of the Kickapoo, uh, being the, which is, a, is an Algonquin uh, language people, <clears throat> um, moving or migrating into the, the, the now Springfield area, uh, primarily just to get away from European settlers. And the, uh, and the Delaware being forcibly mm, given space, uh, primarily along the James River uh, and, and <clears throat> impacting the, the culture, creating culture there, not, you know, you know, not long, comparatively speaking, not long before. <clears throat> it is, it, it, to me, it is very interesting as the looking at these aspects <clears throat> that when you look at, when you read uh, old accounts, particularly of settlers, early settlement, early white settlement in states like Missouri, states like Iowa, that something that you see is uh, early settlers would record that say there's an Indian village here, or there's a trading post and the Indians are doing this or doing that, so on and so forth. And oftentimes without a lot of context, and, and quite frankly, in many cases, the uh, the early white settlers into the area didn't have a lot of context. They might not even have known necessarily what tribe they were dealing with. They just knew sure. there is a settlement and they're not white. 
to a large degree. Pretty much, yeah. <clears throat> and at the and and either do we get along with them or do they not? Do they get along with us or do they not? Those, which of course, if you're out on the 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 frontier and your primary <clears throat> interest is in personal survival and the survival of your family, you're you're probably not going to be real keen on focusing on anything other than that. It's very it was a very pragmatic time for for everyone. You didn't have a whole lot of time to think to to think about things that weren't did not pertain to subsistence, to be honest. <laughs> we need to engage in an immediate anthropological study right now. No, we don't. We need to get ready for winter and we have about six weeks. Uh, those yep. those realities. <clears throat> but many of the uh, many of the Native American groups that white settlers were interacting with were not native to these regions west of the Mississippi. They were uh, oftentimes Northeastern uh, or Northern uh, people groups that were being displaced from places like present day upstate New York or Michigan or Wisconsin or Illinois. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see with, uh, with the Kickapoo. We see that with other uh, woodland uh, language group peoples uh, <clears throat> like the Shawnee and the Potawatomi, et cetera, coming, being pushed into these areas or, or forcibly marched. And then, of course, that leads us to the late 1830s, around 1838, about the time that Springfield was getting officially incorporated, is that one route of the Cherokee Trail of Tears transitioned through what is now uh, the Springfield Metro. And, and I think that's something that most people, even, even if they're aware of the Trail of Tears coming through the Ozarks, they're not aware that there was a route that far north. But really, there, there were several routes. And we hear a lot more about, in southern Missouri, the Trail of Tears going through, say, Berry County around Cassville and so forth. Um, but... Um, I think most people would be surprised, and probably a lot of people who live in Springfield would be surprised that they're walking on ground that was part of the Trail of Tears. Yes, and in some cases, um, interacting with individuals whose ancestors were on that trail. True, true. <clears throat> um, there, I, I think it's, it, it's kind of hard to conceive of the number of, of people that... Um, were affected by the relocation. Yes. Uh, I know it's over, I think, 30,000. I believe roughly. so. And, and to give a, give a sense of scope, it's estimated between around seven to 8,000 were on the trail that came through Springfield. So, you know, that, that's a large percentage. Um, it really is. <clears throat> it, uh, and some of this, for, for people who do know uh, elements of this, they're gonna be like, yeah, we know. Uh, but for folks who don't, the one of the things that I, I find really beautiful and and fascinating and sometimes even sad um, is is how many people have, for example, Cherokee heritage uh, or or other Native group heritage. First of all, some of them may not even know it. Um, others may essentially have this heritage this ancestry invisibly because yeah. they they quite frankly do not look as they would be expected to look right. <clears throat> for having the heritage and it reminds me i cannot tell you the name of this person because i don't remember her name but i remember a long time ago uh having a really um a, a conversation that really impressed me uh, with a, with a, an individual uh, who was on Cherokee uh, tribal roles, and <clears throat> uh, she was uh, blonde. She had blue eyes, and she was speaking to me very eloquently and very passionately about her Cherokee ancestry. And at one point, she said, "And I've heard the drones." And I went, "Pardon me." And she said, I, I've heard the drumming. I've mm -hmm. heard drumming on a, on a spiritual level. 
at key points, juncture points in my life. And I just, I found that to be so beautiful and so moving. It, it, it is, and I've, I've known other people who, with similar, similar accounts, um, not quite as pronounced, but um, that um, if you didn't know, you would not assume that they had native blood. And where it has affected them greatly. I mean, it guides their lives. Uh, and so we, we do walk in this, this area in the Ozarks that is kind of a threshold itself. It's a threshold to what we conceive of as the West and the Old West. It and, is. and it really started here. Um, uh, primarily in around the 1830s with so many of these things going on uh, yes. that when, when you talk about most of the mythos of the old west it started here but is more known in other places and certainly I think pop culture in the 20th century and the 21st century has reinforced that idea because of the prevalence of movies, TV shows, et cetera, highlighting those stories out in the desert uh, in, in, in the far Southwest now, which ironically, this was the Southwest of the United States at the time. This was absolutely the, uh, the, the ragged frontier edge of the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. <clears throat> and and the, the, well, the two things on, on that one, how much, I suppose, uh, <clears throat> artisanship or artifice got inserted in pop culture in the mid 20th century, primarily through uh, Westerns. Yes. <clears throat> and although the, not directly associated with Springfield, certainly directly associated with the Ozarks and Fort Smith, Arkansas, the original story, True Grit, if you read the book, is centered around Fort Smith and the young protagonist of the of the film mm -hmm. is from the Arkansas Ozarks yes and <clears throat> the original True Grit film uh, plays so loosely with those facts that you would have no idea that that there was a connection there with the Ozarks. No, I mean, no, to be honest, you, you assume it's West Texas or someplace, to be honest. Um, the, the remake is, is a little more faithful, yes. I, I love the remake. I, I love I, the Coen Brothers remake. I do. I do, too. And another good example in, <laughs> is um, Clint Eastwood in Hang 'em High. Yes, that took place in Fort Smith. Fortunately, I mean they they were very candid about that, um, and and that it was portrayed that way. And ironically, ironically, some of Clint Eastwood's westerns are sort of sort of the departure from that pop culture motif in that they did stress the connection to the Ozarks. Um, yes, Outlaw Dirty Wales for instance, <clears throat> Unforgiven, you know, um, specifically as well, um, you know, giving a nod to the importance of this area, of the Ozark region in, in the borderlands to those stories. But um, we, we tend to forget that. Um, and yeah. another thing is beyond the settlement with, with, the, um, with the tribes, um, in the Trail of Tears, you know, we, we tend to think of Indian Wars as a far west uh, issue. Yes. Um, think of Custer's Last Stand and Wounded Knee and Geronimo. And we had Indian Wars in, <laughs> in the Missouri Ozarks in the 1830s. Same time as really kind of overlapping a lot of the Trail of Tears and the founding of Springfield. 
it really does. I mean, we're we're looking at we're looking specifically we're looking at the Osage War, uh, the winter of eighteen thirty six into eighteen thirty seven, um, and we're it's it's particularly interesting, also <clears throat> heartbreaking because the 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 point and and the the actual resolve of the uh, of the Osage War was comparatively uh, pacifistic. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> the the issue is that they were running the Osage out of Missouri. Yes. Um, now, you know, uh, the Osage, uh, I guess, is a little background for it to make sense to people. The Osage had moved out of Missouri and Arkansas yes. in, I think, 1808, uh, 1812. They had signed treaties and moved into Kansas and Oklahoma. And but the problem was that their hunting grounds were poor over there. So um, they, they wait basically 20 some years and things aren't getting better. So they decide we're, we're going back to our old hunting grounds for food. And yes. that's, that was the beginning. Yes, and <clears throat> you can't blame them. No. I mean, this, this was <clears throat> not only hunting grounds, but um, you know, summer camps and and part and <clears throat> for people who are not familiar, the the Osage were were a migratory people of the um, Sioux or Lakota language group, and notable in the fact that they were uh, the you know your <clears throat> European contact writing things down, journaling things out that we still have records for. Is that the, the Osage were notable for two things: one. Um, their statuesque beauty and two the fact that they were terrifying in war yes and not just not just to european settlers but also to other indians yes and including the, the cherokee including the cherokee with a pinship for beheadings um yes. and that uh, and that <clears throat> but you think about that and of course you know tying this into springfield that <clears throat> The Springfield Plain, the the space of it is now Springfield, was part of that summer hunting ground, mm-hmm. and there were there were these spot you know sections in and not just for hunting, uh, not just for hunting animals, but also root digging for gathering herbs for uh, medicinals for plants for all of these things, <clears throat> and the and the utilization of the springs. So one of one of the aspects there there's there's two competing stories. I don't know which one. To go with, um, I'm gonna gonna land on balls, uh, but that that uh, Springfield originally what is now downtown that there were a lot of springs before the before urban infrastructure, uh, lots and lots of freshwater springs, and it was a field with lots of springs, hence Springfield. But we also have the pot- potential that is named after Springfield, Massachusetts, um, or, or, or Illinois, or Illinois. So. <clears throat> um, Actually, actually, I think Springfield is one. I I, I think there uh, Springfield is in more states than virtually any other named town. So lots of Springfield. I I saw a map one time that said if you want to take a road trip to every Springfield in the United in the contiguous United States, here's your route. And uh, having grown up an hour and a half away from the one in Illinois, I'm kind of like, okay, fine. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, all that to be said, so there, there is that. We do know that there were a lot of springs uh-huh. in, the, in the area. And it, it is very reasonable to conjecture that uh, the Osage, particular uh, clan groups of the Osage found what is now Springfield to be a very important location. And mm-hmm. you, you think about <clears throat> the even just, you know, territory and survival aside, you think about the emotional attachments that these generations of people would have had with these locations. And then to be told, you know what, somebody somewhere, not you, uh, signed a treaty, <clears throat> not here. Mm-hmm. And now you're going to do this, whether you want to or not. And then when you comply with it, you suddenly are having a hard time feeding your people. 
Yes. <clears throat> and you're watching your loved one starve to death in the winter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, and when you say no, um, <clears throat> the, the antagonistic group to which you say no to records it as the Osage War of 1836-37. Yes. Now there were skirmishes. There were skirmishes, um, and, and in fact, there were there's one what is now the square in Carthage, Missouri, um, during that time period. So um, it, it was a, a tense time, and and actually, um, Judge Yancey from Springfield um, actually went out and tried to negotiate between the parties. Um, not necessarily successfully, but he attempted and. We'll probably get to Judge Yancey in the next episode on Springfield because he factors into some other noir history as well. That he does. And <clears throat> in coming down to Springfield itself, uh, although the mm, 1830s to 1860s Springfield Square would probably be very unrecognizable to today's folks who are familiar with the current Springfield Square, the footprint is the same. Yes, or it is. Itself. The, the square itself is is in the same spot, same size, etc. different buildings, <laughs> most different buildings. <clears throat> um, in fact, there is more, um, there was a, um, a courthouse built on, see, the northeast side in 1837. Um, and it, uh, they were building the new courthouse on the opposite side of the square on the northwest side. Um, <clears throat> early before the war started, the Civil War started. And um, it, there, there are some accounts that um, the old courthouse was burned down uh, during the battle in Springfield. Uh, but in reality, it, uh, one of the prisoners had gotten a hold of matches and set it on fire. Small detail. There was a, a, a number of mills and courthouses were yes. casualties during the Civil War. Yes. For, for a variety well, of reasons. It was easy to say that it was part of the battle because it happened while the battle was going on. But it, basically because because... The jailers were too busy with the battle to worry about the prisoners grabbing matches so and burning the old courthouse down. Um, well, do what you got to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, <clears throat> the Civil War had a huge impact on Springfield. It, it, it really did. I mean, well, Springfield was basically an occupied town throughout the war. Um, first by the by the Federal Union Army, and then after the Battle of Wilson's Creek, by the Confederates until after Pea Ridge in February 1862, and then it um, came under federal control again. Um, but most of downtown Springfield. Uh, was garrisoned and you had um, you had cannons and um, and you know it, it it was set up as a, basically as a fortified town. Um, yeah. yes. And the new courthouse, the new courthouse, which was uh, on the northwest corner, which for those of you familiar with Springfield, the old hers department store, which has been vacant for a very long time now, uh, sits where that courthouse was. And during the, the Civil War, it was a it was headquarters for the army and hospital, military hospital. So you had people with grievous injuries and, and deaths there all during the war. And ironically, um, as an aside, the HERS building, I've heard for, well, ever since I was in college, that it's haunted. So, and I've always wondered, is it haunted for something that went on during the department store days, or is it really from the Civil War? Or, or some of each, and we, 
we get experiences like that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think a number of people would be really surprised to know the amount of civil war violence and casualties that took place within the the spring modern Springfield city limits. True, true. I mean, there, well, there's a Mark Graves um, down around Drury um, where there's at least 800 soldiers buried. And correct me if I am wrong on this, because I seem to remember this. <clears throat> that on occasion the earthenwork uh, fortifications are in some cases still extant, but oftentimes not marked or realized in terms of what they actually are. Yes, yes, there are there there are a few places around, particularly around Drury and, and Central High School and through there where you can see them and it's pretty obvious, but there, there are um, several places that the earthen works, <laughs> remnants of them are still there. And I think that, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the simple fact that we have these, these spaces, or for example, downtown intersections that some of the most heaviest fighting, for example, of the second battle of, of Springfield took place with <clears throat> while, and again, something that we see now, we have Wilson's Creek, uh, the Battle of Wilson's Creek, and then of course on the, the Missouri-Arkansas border, the Battle of Pea Ridge, mm -hmm. uh, August of 1861 and March of 1862, respectively, in which you have large scale land battles with large scale land battle casualties. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> something that I think is is honestly a shame um, because it, it overlooks just the the, the human um, the human cost mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that because many of the more recognized battles of the Civil War dealt with mass casualties on a almost unimaginable scope that smaller battles oftentimes get mm, filed away as being inconsequential. And, you know, the, the estimated, uh, estimated casualties for the Second Battle of Springfield uh, was 30 Union uh, soldiers killed, uh, six missing and 195 wounded. And the uh, estimates approximately for Confederates was 45 killed or missing with 105 wounded and a, uh, a conflicting estimate on the Confederate side of 70 to 80 Confederate soldiers killed with 12 captured and 200 wounded. And this all took place basically just south of downtown off of Campbell Street. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we're, we're dealing with, um, you know, January 8th, 1863, all in one day. <clears throat> and this is, I, I think it's a testament to the, the unimaginable scope of casualties and death in the Civil War, that something like this gets... Uh, small markers, and I'm not saying that you know we need to have a marker campaign or whatever, but it's it's a footnote in the in American history. It's a footnote in Civil War history. Is mm -hmm. something that I would wager that the majority of Springfield citizens are unaware of, and yet uh, a, a minimum of 75 men dead in one day. Yeah. You know, if, this I mean, was, if this were a modern day accident, it would be a mass casualty event on nationwide news. Well, it would be considered that. Yes, it, it definitely would. And, you know, Springfield wasn't that big at the time either. I think that's one another thing to to point out. It, you know, we're talking a town of just a few thousand people. Yes. Um, and <coughs> uh having two battles and and um that and then in your town fortified for four years um yes 
th th this is what we, you know, we hear about, you know, places like Richmond and so forth, you mm -hmm. know, going through and, and obviously those make sense, but you don't really think about it out here, but it, it happened. And that kind of tension and, and, uh, I, I know one one account of a I want to say he was a store owner uh, during the war um, went home for lunch and as he was walking back he you know was uh, mistaken uh, not recognized by soldiers on patrol and confronted and almost they almost shot him before they realized who he was. Um, wow. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that, you know, people were living with. And um, then when, when the war ended, it, you know, it, you didn't just have a boom, you know, everything's back to civilian norm, normalcy. And you, you still had all of these people and these soldiers in town, and now you had other ones coming into town that that had been Confederates that weren't there before, uh, and some that had been coming and going too, um, that created other tensions that basically led to the first legend of the Old West. Yes, <clears throat> yes, on the square, on in the square, 18, July of 1865. So. Uh, very shortly after the close of the Civil War, and mm -hmm. uh, clearly at a point that the immediate Missouri region was refinding itself to the best of its ability, mm -hmm. and we uh, we we have a, a legend uh, of the Old West being born in in the le the the legend, not the man. Um, man being born in Illinois, the legend uh, beginning in, uh, in downtown Springfield on the square. That's right, while Bill Hickok. Um, and and, and I, think, I think it's one thing to say too, um, it, we always, you know, it's often said, you know, that that's where he became a legend, but um, the flip side of that is his opponent, Davis Tutt, um, as they walked onto the square that day, it was anyone's guess who was going to win because they both were accomplished gunmen. They both were soldiers. They they both were dangerous men with a gun, and it you know it it could have gone either way. It could have, and not to mention that they were best friends. <laughs> yeah, which is particularly tragic, really, and and. Uh, although that much more easy to romanticize, thank you, Harper's Bazaar, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, for covering this and beginning the process to make Wild Bill Hickok uh, a legend, mm -hmm. uh, a legendary name of the Old West. And I find it particularly powerful that this event took place not only in the Ozarks, but in, in downtown Springfield. And interestingly enough, of course, at a, at a juncture point in which Springfield and Southwest Missouri was the Wild West, literally. It, it was. I think you know. Our looking back in time, we we don't think of that because we think, oh, we're in the middle of the country. But this was the jumping off uh, point, uh, <clears throat> the edge of civilization, and um, you you had you had those factors, and so you know we've said it before on Dark Ozarks, but it, it really is true that any, whatever happened in the Old West happened in the Ozarks first. It and, did. It did. and in this case, you had a, a, you know, a call out, walk down gunfight, um, which, uh, you know, histor Western historians will tell you didn't happen any other place that they really know of other than this event. Um, and it was sort of, you know, cre creating that mythos as it happened. And, yes. and the participants weren't thinking of it that way. And I think that's one thing to think too, you know, 
they Dave Tutt and Wild Bill Hickok were having an argument. Um, two friends, you know, with probably too much whiskey and <laughs> fighting over a card game, and a pocket watch, and a girl. And <clears throat> which is the is of course the the classic makings of of of, of all of well not all but many of these stories uh, oh, yeah. stretching a hundred years and more into the into the future when it's getting <clears throat> um, recreated by Hollywood and I, I've you know something to bear in mind that so many times when these stories get recreated they they conveniently uh you shot them and in <clears throat> either the uh the great american southwest the the desert uh dramatic desert scapes or with towering rocky mountains behind them but mm -hmm. the the emotional resonance and the archetypal resonance of the stories and the human aspect of the story is is really what we're talking about and yeah this this beginning <clears throat> and of course this is also coming off of you know that <clears throat> there's there's a lot of different pieces to this first of all there is the fact that tut and hickok were both um men who had been through the war on opposing yes. sides uh hickok originally from illinois tut from yellville arkansas uh hickok fought in the battle of wilson's creek i believe Mm -hmm. um, Tut, even before the war, had been part of a feud uh, near Yellville, in which I believe his father was killed. Yes, uh, Dave was a yeah, was a pretty young boy, but he 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 lived through the the feud, the Everett Tut Wars, what they called it, um, and uh, his father was killed. So he, he had seen these things happen. Um, and then Wild Bill, he had he had killed men before the war. Um, ironically, left Illinois because he thought he killed a man in a bare fist fight in a river and didn't. Um, and then ended up on the plains in Kansas, buffalo hunting and so on and so forth. Uh, then became a scout for the Union Army and was at Wilson's Creek and other um, I saw other action in in this theater. Um, and was in Springfield for a lot of the war. Uh, it was in Springfield that he really honed his skills as a gunman. Um, and uh, there are some early accounts of him practicing shooting in an alley, things like that. You just, you don't think of those things. Um, and um, then, um, Somewhere during the war, he and Tech got acquainted, and they both were, you know, gamblers. And in July of 1865, a culmination of things. Um, uh, Tech beat Hickok at poke or at Pharaoh at cards, and Hickok couldn't pay pay up right then, and so uh, sort of the the fatal move, in hindsight, probably, was that Dave Tut grabbed his pocket watch and said he was going to hold it until he got paid. Yes. And Hickok was mad and said that was his father's watch and he better not wear it in public. Well, so Tut took that as, you know, a slap to honor that since it was said publicly that if he didn't wear it in public, he'd be viewed as a coward. Yes. <clears throat> and if he, did, if he did, that Hickok would be mad. So honor culture won out. He wore the watch. Hickok called him on it and did a call out for a fight. Now, and, 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 and I guess I get where some people would say, well, why wasn't this just a duel? You know, we, we, we had a color, colorful individual <laughs> at this bat today. Um, and, um, well, this was just a duel. That's all it was. Um, but dueling was something very different. Um, very much so. And while Bill, when he called Tut out and Tut answered, they created a entirely different 
kind of confrontation. <clears throat> yes. Du you know, dueling had gone back hundreds of years. There, there, there was the code, what the Kodo Dula, I forget what it's how it's pronounced in Italian, um, that um, it had been honored on the East Coast and in the South. Um, there are very strict rules, and it's all designed to hopefully no one get hurt. As a, and that seems very counterintuitive, but it is part of the process that mm -hmm. the, 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 these two uh, men of aristocratic bearing can, under very strict rules, meet one another in the field, quote unquote. <clears throat> uh, and, and the real point is that they both have the courage to show up and participate. Yes. And <clears throat> with the earlier firearms, the potential of missing was a lot higher. And, and, and often they would purposely miss too. Which is such an interesting aspect of it. But it's the idea that you faced death or faced the potential of death. Mm -hmm. And then uh, theoretically, both parties walk away with their honor intact and having resolved. <clears throat> Something that was very interesting that uh, <clears throat> um, in uh, actually one of the books that I need to return uh, to you, uh, Violence and Honor in the Old South, <clears throat> speaking of this, this innately dualistic nature of the duel uh, mm -hmm. after, after covering its precise, uh, I was reading this early yesterday morning, uh, the precise, <laughs> un, unreal, not unwittingly that, that it would actually apply for today, you just never know, but it, <clears throat> a couple of things, one, the, the barbarism of the duel being consistently decried by elements right. of society, and then a interesting uh, cognitive dissonance that many would use to explain saying, yes, it's terribly barbaric, and yes, it's really bad, and no, there's no way I can sign off on this, but if my honor is sullied, I'm doing it. And <clears throat> that at the same time that it, it may have actually functioned as, as a way of conflict resolution that minimized death yes. and prevented uh, worse um, violence because this was violence within a structure. Exactly, exactly. And uh, Duleen at this point, you know, had been outlawed in Missouri as in most, I think pretty well everywhere by, certainly by the 1860s. And so and actually, when it did still occur uh, formally as a duel, they tended to meet on islands in the middle of the Mississippi and places like that, so they could argue that they weren't in either any state or either state, so they could be prosecuted. Um, a little twist on we're, we're satisfying honor, but we're we're going to do it under the radar. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mr. Pike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, whole oh, other story there. Um, but um, you know, with Hickok and Tut, I think one, the Civil War had kind of thrown that out. Yeah, in, in many ways, and these were men who were used to action and violence and acting on it, and so you had the call out which, you know, technically you do with a duel, but then we don't follow the, the, re the rest of the rules. You just show up and, and um, so Davis said had to decide whether to do so. Now, another issue that kind of probably contributed to all of this was they were feuding about a girl. Yes. They've kind of been fussing about this girl, and then, um, uh, then the 
poker game and the pocket watch was sort of the last straw and um hickok decided to make an issue of honor um whereas ironically when he was 18 he ran away from facing consequences of he thought was murder so it's kind of funny because he had had a bad grant you know he had had something in his past that would kind of maybe affect how he viewed this as well as tut with the family feud and his father dying um so they both decided to walk out on the square they did and something that i think is uh, a potential aspect or a potential context of the culture that that's easy for us to overlook at this point is that Tut was implying that Hickok wasn't wasn't good for his his debts that he wasn't that he right. he might not be worth uh, paying up in right. in a card game and, and I think it was twenty five dollars which was a good sum of money in eighteen sixty five. Yeah, and and along with that comes the contextual implication that uh, basically you're a man without honor, but also, and of course we can we we look at at sometimes those points in the past and we go oh you're you know uh, you're making a mountain out of a molehill, uh, but in this particular case it could mean that uh, that in, in the if word of this got around, which it obviously already had, uh, mm -hmm. that the people would stop um, playing cards with Hickok. And there's some implication that at this juncture point in his life, that was his primary source of income. Very true. And, it, you know, I mean, which was very common. I mean, um, very common for a lot of these guys who ultimately were lawmen, gunmen, et cetera. Um, that they they would at various times be professional gamblers. Yes, and <clears throat> it, it, so I mean, for for individuals who have a far removed sense of personal honor in that nineteenth century, and particularly um, frontier sense or mountain sense, you could find it hard to relate to this situation. Mm -hmm. But nobody finds it hard to relate to. You might be completely out of money and not be able to buy food the next day, that sort of thing. Yeah, very true, very true. And, you know, there, there were a lot of witnesses. Um, yes. there were, and, they definitely were not doing this in a back alley. No, they, they weren't. Um, you know, it had been called out for the, the time and place in front of a crowd. Um, there were at least, you know, over 20 witnesses, I think 24, if I recall right, that ultimately were called before the court. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the witnesses all kind of went, I don't know. <laughs> what we I do didn't know. See nothing. <laughs> I didn't see nothing. <laughs> some said they heard one shot, some said they heard two. Uh, they really weren't sure. They weren't sure who pulled triggers, or they weren't really sure whether you know uh, Hickok had had even fired a gun, etc. And um, then, based on all of that, he was acquitted. Otherwise, he would have been hanged, and we would have never yeah. known his name. <clears throat> and there's there are so many elements of the modern myth and the romanticism and the magic of the old west in essentially a split moment we yeah. are we are talking about first of all a hell of a shot yeah it's um, a long it's a long shot it is 75 yards with a navy colt yeah and the the implication from at least some of the reports is that tut and Hickok filed, fired simultaneously. Yeah. Which would explain individuals believing they had only heard one shot. Yes. Uh, and... Tut missed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the suggestion certainly is that he may not have missed by much. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't really think that 
that is an issue. It's not that, you know, he didn't get a shot off probably or that he was really that far off the mark. Um, and it, it could have gone either way. I think that's, yeah. I think that is one thing to say. <laughs> Sometimes you will hear people say, well, if, if Tut fired first, it was in self-defense. Um, well, Hickok is the one who called him out to the fight to begin with. Yes. You know, so he's the one who said, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to kill you. Um, At this time in this place. Yes. Be there. Um, and. But I, I don't really think that's really an issue. I don't think that there I don't think there was much doubt that. Um, he, you know, he was pulling a gun and even if he got a shot off first he showed up voluntarily this is not something that you know you he was caught out on the street and a gun shoved in his face and you know he had no notice um, um he walked he walked on the square willingly that day and i think i think that's one thing that everyone has to remember is they both made that decision yes um, <laughs> And, and I think that it from the from the court records, <clears throat> that was a a primary factor uh, coming into the into the acquittal. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and um, uh, you know that would be viewed that would it probably would not play out that way today. But um, <laughs> no, but this was one year after the Civil War. Less than a year, even, you yeah. know, I mean, it's the time and place that 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 really, really factor into it. And, you know, um, you know, Hickok is remembered for how he died, you know, uh, playing poker and with the dead man's hand. Um, yes. But ironically, I, I think in some ways the the, the gunfight on the Springfield Square um, says something more about his legend than his end actually because um it shows you know him coming into his own as a gunman and his contemporaries when you know he was known you know as a lawman as as a gambler and a gunman and by and large uh, you know, there was a, a lot of his contemporaries who were on both sides of the law who all agreed that Wild Bill was the best gunman they had ever run into. Yes. Um, there is a story that um, that he and Jesse James actually uh, crossed paths once. Uh, and I want to say that it was... Um, in Kansas City, it was the Kansas City or St. Joe, and that basically um, uh, they wa each walked out onto the street, recognized each other, and kind of stared each other down, and neither one pulled a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of said. <laughs> Which, you know, and some people say, well, why would Jesse want to pull a gun on him? Well, he, he, he was a union man. Right. <clears throat> and right. so he, he fit, the, fit the bill um, as, as to that. And apparently there was some talk that, that uh, Jesse James had, had said that if he ever met Wild Bill, he was going to shoot him. Wow. And it... <clears throat> so many so many moving parts and so many individuals who if they if for example if they had lived um they might be recognized as as household names of of this era and then other etc <clears throat> a couple a couple of things just out of the even just as a result of the trial um that i found particularly interesting uh, a prominent Springfield attorney gave a speech to the crowd from the balcony of the courthouse, denouncing the verdict as, quote, against the evidence and all decency. And there was talk of lynching Hickok. Yeah. 
as a um, just to me, I think that, that that speaks in terms of the the contextualization that human behavior certainly hasn't changed since the 1860s. And um, <laughs> uh, so many, so many aspects to that. Um, the, well, it's also, it also is in, in, interesting to me, you know, some people would be just really, you know, aghast at that. But when, when we're talking about the summer of 1865 in Southwest Missouri, they'd just gone through four years of lots of lynchings mm -hmm. during the war. So people, yes. get, people kind of going to that, being upset with something in context makes more sense than it would now it does <clears throat> and that's before we even get to the beheadings so true. <laughs> that's true. it's uh, a a interesting time in missouri history now you know not long after september 13th 1865 colonel ward colonel george ward nichols uh, a writer for harper's bazaar found mm -hmm. hickok and began the interviews that would ultimately bring Hickok's name into nationwide and of course even international focus. Yes, and, and by all accounts, uh, while Bill was the primary testimony and, yeah. and was quite adept at spinning his own story. <laughs> well, <clears throat> the uh a not the only but a, a a very important part of the american hero motif is to be really really good at self-promotion yes because that's just the game. <laughs> we're we're americans what can i say yeah that's <laughs> it, true it's 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 an innate part of our unique culture, rapidly being exported around the world by multinational brands. Um, but uh, David Tut was originally buried in the Springfield City Cemetery. He mm -hmm. was reinterred in the Maple Park Cemetery in March of 1883. Interestingly enough, by Tut's half brother Lewis, uh, who was a former slave and the son of Tut's father. Uh, and one of his father's female slaves. Yes. And Lewis, if I remember right, was a deputy in Greene County for a brief time. Oh, that is cool. And I want to say that he is buried in Springfield. I may be wrong on that, but I want to say he's buried in Springfield as well. <clears throat> Well, need, we need to look that up. Uh, at, at the time of all of this, the, the locations of a lot of these things happening are cl pretty clearly known, pretty clearly marked. There are markers mm -hmm. on the square mm -hmm. uh, uh, of all of this. <clears throat> and it, it's neat to actually go to the Springfield Square specifically for the purpose of locating this, because it does give you an idea of the distances involved. It's not... Uh, it's a long way for for a for a shot. It, it really is. It really is. Um, and there's been a debate over time whether or not Hickok steadied the gun on his forearm and you know things like that. And um, I, I think it's rather poignant. I mean, just I mean, it, it, it's almost you know uh, a Hollywood western scene. You know when Tuck gets <clears throat> shot. He uh, takes a few steps and looks at the fellows around him and says, "You know, boys, I, I, I'm I'm dead," and fell over dead on the steps of the courthouse. Yes, <clears throat> yes. It's to me, it's very poignant to say the it, least. It, it really is. It really is, and um, and really, I mean. They could have gone either way, and, and Davis Tett walked off the square of hero and legend. You know, I mean, it, it yes. very well could have gone the other way. It it could have. You just <clears throat> the the aspect of the fates are 
<laughs> are quite powerful, uh, particularly right now during Saturnalia. But uh, but anytime, really. And uh, I, I found this a, a really interesting note. Uh, it's just an aside, perhaps a closing note of uh, this particular part of the story. But uh, Hickok was living in the Lion House, uh, which is a boarding house on South Avenue. And uh, from what we can tell, it's uh, it's it's actual present day location. Of course, the that building has been long is long gone, replaced by commercial property. But it's uh, three eighteen South Avenue, Springfield, would mm -hmm. be the location for where the boarding house was, in which Hickok was staying at the time. Yes, I mean it's you know all these places are there, and um, which is very you know is really interesting to think about. And and the, the, the there's there's two aspects of that that I find really really fascinating. The first one is how much this history exists but is overlooked. Yes. Uh, the second is how much history that is there that there is documentation for it may not be well known, but there is documentation for it and. These are not difficult locations to find or, 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 or go to, you know, to physically go to. Exactly. So that, that's something that, you know, we, we will probably be doing at some point. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and <clears throat> on, on all of these, particularly in the downtown area, um, immediately south and east of downtown, et cetera, were, were spaces of... Uh, of war, violence, uh, deaths, etc. And if you're a Springfieldian and you're curious about paranormal activity, etc., and have things that you'd like to share, please do not hesitate, either uh, publicly or privately. If you need to share privately, we're more than happy to keep everything private on that regard and respect everybody's mm -hmm. spaces. If it's a space that you feel comfortable having that be more public, that works too. We're just always curious about individuals firsthand experiences yes we are i mean there's and there's certainly a number of hauntings in the downtown area um yes. we'll probably get into more of that later perhaps next week but um you know some people might be surprised that central high school has been renowned as being haunted for a very long time i i, I remember being there in high in in high school uh, for events and just being there for the day and hearing tales of, of hauntings in the building. And, um, and then of course, Drury certainly is, um, has its hauntings around the square, um, University um, Plaza. Yes, resident ghost, and um, many more. Absolutely, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into some of those. But there, are, I, I guess this may, maybe to switch gears a little bit. There, there, there have been some odd happenings, you know, that um, <laughs> in in Springfield's history. And I think, I think one of my sort of the just the those odd asides that I always find interesting is the Cobra Scare. Me too. Uh, certainly, nothing initiates a visceral response like cobras. For many people, myself included, don't want to run into one though. No, uh, very, very knee-jerk response of "Oh my gosh, that's absolutely terrifying." I'm just going to crawl up on top of something and stay there because. <laughs> For for individuals who, who like me are you know I, I deeply respect uh, snakes in their space but they can be absolutely terrifying. Now where I come from in Illinois, the likelihood of running across a venomous snake, while not impossible, is extremely low. It is more likely down here with copperhead, yeah. um, timber rattlers, water moccasins. Pygmy rattlers. Okay, anyway, uh, 
but none of none of them as dangerous as comparatively dangerous as is our venomous snake species are are anywhere near a cobra yes and of course people may be asking why are we talking about cobras in springfield missouri <laughs> 1953 <laughs> 1953 and near in downtown or near downtown uh, a, a minimum of 11 cobras were killed. And as I recall, they, 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 they never had a definitive resolution as to where they came from, but they assumed that they were let loose from a pet store, I think. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Um, there is one report that said between 1953 and 1988, the person in question never said a word, but in 1988 apparently made an alleged confession that uh, he was 14 years old and the, uh, the, the fish that he had gotten from said downtown pet store had died and he was angry about that. And in response, and took the lid off the cage of the pet store's cobras. Of course, I want to know why does a pet store have a bunch of cobras who's buying cobras? <laughs> it's one thing, a ball python is one thing, but a cobra, come on. <laughs> They're hot sellers. Um, <laughs> now, now, for the record, something that has existed for a long time is uh, you know an interest in exotic and dangerous animals. True, true. <clears throat> And there is certainly the possibility that uh, uh, restrictions on really dangerous animals were not as strict in 1953 as they are today. And, but and like this might have led to more restrictions. <laughs> this is how restrictions happen, people. This is how it works. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. This isn't. This isn't good. <laughs> This is really not good. So if, and again, that particular report is alleged. Yes. Uh, it, it may have been the case. It may have been the case that this, this guy, uh, you know, waited all these years. Or, you know, let's face it. People are crazy. People do interesting things and say interesting things for a variety of reasons. Somebody literally could have dreamed this up in 1988 and said, hey, remember the, the, the cobra scare? This is what happened. So the truth is we don't know, but we do know that a unusually statistically, you know, per capita, unusually high number of cobras were in downtown Springfield for a brief period of time in 1953. For whatever reason. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Downtown Springfield kind of wandered into the territory of dangerous animals in the Everglades for a moment. You know? <laughs> it, was a, it was a time slip. Um, and <laughs> I, I can't help but just contemplate the, the aspects of how unsettling that would have been at the time. Yeah. And, <laughs> I mean, and and talk about i mean in essence this is while while there are potentially very ex, very explicable reasons for this phenomena this is technically a cryptid an animal out of place true that's true you you don't usually find cobras in the mid you know in the middle of the country yeah. so no, absolutely terrifying. Uh, yeah, like I said, I, I have an enormous amount of respect for snakes and strongly encourage everyone to know precisely the snake species, recognize the snake, snake species, respond and react accordingly to snake said snake species, be responsible uh, with our uh, species in regards to the whole herpetology issue. <laughs> That said, I think they're absolutely terrifying, and uh, even more so when they are extremely venomous. Yes. 
<laughs> so from there, you know, um, perhaps um, we should delve into everyone's favorite urban legend in Springfield. Just the briefly. albino farm. Yeah. Uh, we have <clears throat> had to, I'm, I'm assuming, considering the number of people who ask us to cover the albino farm, on a very regular basis, I'm assuming that we're going to have some folks who are ready for us to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, guess what? It's an urban legend. Yes. Massive um, spoiler alert. Yeah, it's it, it it really is. It's and it's one of those that you almost want to stand and kind of blink slowly and go, "How did you guys get from here to here?" Um, yes. You know. Um, for those, you know, we we get people who ask, where is the albino farm? One, there was never a place called the albino farm. That that was a concoction of college kids in the 60s. Please um, see, exit 43. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all the adrenaline from the cobra scare that God did. Oh my God. Um, I'm I'm being I'm being totally facetious. Yes, it it, it is. It is, to me, this is a classic uh, urban legend, mm -hmm. uh, mid-century to into really, I think, probably reaching its its peak late 1970s into the 80s, and then you know continuing to take on a life of its own in the 90s. Urban legend. I I, I agree. I agree. I mean, um, originally. It's a farm. It was the Sheedy family farm. It was a yes. large Irish family. <clears throat> and they called it the Spring Lawn Farm. Um, it's still there, technically. Um, you are not supposed to go on it. Uh, so we do, we discourage people from trespassing. 100%. No, it's private property. It's, Yes, no urban exploring. No, and <clears throat> there's really, I mean, you, what the interesting aspect of this is not the location because the location is a family farm. That, yeah. That's the, the ends, that's the heritage, that's the history of the location. The interesting thing is this legend that gets built up over time that essentially from a cultural standpoint creates its own weather pattern uh, yeah. that is is larger and greater than than the location could possibly be or really any location because it it extends beyond reality it really does and in the story really you know, it seems to sort of mushroom in the 1950s the beginnings okay. of it I was you curious know, the late, when the real kickoff late, was. Yeah, the late 50s. Uh, and, and basically what happened, the family owned it for a very long time. Um, and, you know, they, they had a lot. I think there were eight or nine children. There was a trust with the parents so that when they died, it went to the children. If one of the children died, it, it, their interest was divided among the remaining children until the last child died and so they tended to stay to themselves so you you know I think there was a curiosity factor there um then um somehow the albino part of the of the legend comes in and th this is almost the scooby-doo type version you know we we have supposedly you know the story went that the family had albinoism you don't know no, they didn't then there was a version that there was a caretaker there we, we have our caretaker and that this was an albino and then it morphed into the, you know murders took place and things like that supposedly in the legend um and the albino would carry a hatchet or an axe um which uh you know is check off another box of urban legend. Um, ironically, not too many miles away, there is a, 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 a place in the Springfield area that is the Hatchet Man Bridge, which had a legend of 
basically this this man, man with a hatchet would chase people and then over time it became you know it was a ghost of a man with a hatchet and so it was the hatchet man bridge and i kind of think part of this got merged with the albino idea and so now you have an albino hatchet man murdering people at the albino farm which is actually the sheedy family farm yes <clears throat> I, but, I yeah, but go it goes so bad that that trespass. You know, you know, kids, college kids would go out, and they had to hire security to run people off. And I mean, it, it really got out of hand. Yes, <clears throat> yes. And as as just as we were going over this, I was thinking about some points of comparison. We're uh, post post war. Uh, mm -hmm. World War II war, post World right. War II. We are <clears throat> looking at, you know, of course, for the, you know, the Second World War was obviously a, a worldwide event that affected nearly everyone uh, in mm -hmm. the industrialized world. And lots and lots of people who were not in the industrialized world were was not anticipating having armies mm -hmm. and navies showing up in their backyard. Sure. Uh, and either conscripting them or killing them. But <clears throat> unlike the, the American Civil War in the 1860s, fast forward the 80 years to um, the Second World War, the contiguous United States was, the, the war did not reach um, the, to any large degree the United States, right. thankfully. And while many of our men and fighting men and women served overseas and were killed um, in, in that we did not have land battles, we did not have bombings, we did not have these things here in the United States. And <clears throat> at, the, at the same time, we look at the major uh, cultural and industrial changes that dr drastically shifted the, the, the nature of the United States during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And we see similarly mass cultural change taking place in the 1940s and the 1950s. And cultural change that is much easier to overlook because it is not being affected by immediate battles right so it's not violent in that sense no and so you you don't it's it's easy not to realize just how um how much upheaval how much almost calamitous change to the previous culture that took place but it was things like essentially the emptying of rural America for uh, urban industrial centers. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> one of the things that I, I find potentially very fascinating about this dynamic is that you have, first of all, in the say 15 years prior to uh, this urban legend developing, mm -hmm. you have a generation of Americans leaving the farms, uh, leaving their small communities that had become over several generations, very tight knit, uh, structured and structural communities in which everyone knows pretty much everyone. Um, and we see this transition to the impersonality of the suburbs of the uh, sort of cookie cutter homes, cookie cutter lives, uh, and and the fact that increasingly our our uh, our human nature identity being shaped by our choice of brands, uh, our association with uh, with larger industry, our association with uh, the, that strata of American commercialism, then the children of that upheaval go to school. They go to school. And suddenly in large droves are going to places like MSU, not mm -hmm. MSU at the time, but, yeah. um, <clears throat> and 
it reminded me, and I may be completely bonkers, uh, but it reminded me a little bit of the some of the reports uh, that we we had in regards to skinwalkers, how the the skinwalker uh, shaman cult held an important place, but existed within a a, a community and a cultural fabric that mm -hmm. prevented elements of it from becoming dangerous or becoming toxic, that it's important to utilize that this, this uh, um, subcult, and I use that term in a mostly positive way, I'm not using it as a pejorative, uh, that this subcult had value and structure, but as uh, Native American peoples, particularly the Navajo, uh, had their community fabric destroyed, Mm -hmm. by um, <clears throat> intervention, by federal intervention and the transition to the reservations and the destruction of that structure that the, the subset cults uh, could become toxic or out of control because they were no longer being balanced by a, a larger process or a larger global context for their, the people. In a almost unspoken or uh unrecognized way i think that we see something similar with these large droves of kids suddenly going to college being uh stripped even unconsciously of that fabric and then beginning to make their own through the development of urban legend well i th I, I think there's something there i mean it's 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 that sudden freedom and unrestrained, unrestricted, and what do you do with it? I think there's, I, th I think there's merit there. And then something else that comes to my mind is these are also kids who suddenly find themselves in the Cold War. And yeah. so in the past, you, you felt like you could identify who, you know, where your dangers were. And even during World War II, you knew where the dangers were and weren't. Now under, uh, with the Cold War, you knew there was a huge danger, but it was everywhere. And yeah. there was a powerlessness. And so um, I, I think it, it became a, you know, almost an unspoken, spoken in some, you know, knowledge in some ways but sort of this ongoing unspoken feeling of we know any moment could be the end and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it um yes. which <clears throat> creates a need to face those fears and face the boogeyman and if you don't yes. have a boogeyman you create one right and then you go face him, much yeah. to the uh, chagrin of the Shreedy family. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> just, just hang out a little placard that says "Axe murdering albino not here today." Check in later. <laughs> yes, if it weren't for those kids, <laughs> those silly <family> kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> rot row. Oh, <laughs> um, and then of course, uh, another spicy aspect of the urban subculture of the Queen City involves vampires. It does, and there's there there's two aspects of it here that I that are interesting to me. One is is definitely a 1990s culture that was not restricted to Springfield. It, it existed no. in various urban places around America, uh, a vampire um, lifestyle. And yes. um, there, there was a large um, uh, vampire culture in New York City and New Orleans and various other places, a pretty prominent murder of a journalist in New York City during the late 80s, early 90s, um, um, highlighted this. And all, all of this kind of came 
to the forefront through a pretty prominent uh, murder trial in the 90s, the Feeney murder trial. And yes. we'll, we'll get into that next time. But I think it's also uh, worthy of note that this was not you know, just a product of the 1980s and 90s in Springfield, that actually the idea of a vampire subculture, there are hints of it going back quite a ways in Springfield that you can't tie to this other, to the broader pop culture movement. And, and that aspect of it <clears throat> to me is incredibly fascinating because the, the broader subculture is heavily influenced by pop culture. Yeah. And <clears throat> let's face it, one of our favorite novelists is heavily responsible for those. At least for the modern modern day. Well, for the for the modern pop culture mythos of vampires across the world. Yes. Thank you, Anne Rice. We we do yes. love you. <laughs> yes. Um, the interview with the vampire is still one of my all-time favorite books. And Brilliantly done. It it's quite magnificent. And and Anne Rice was just a a, a largely phenomenal writer and yes. and uh, and thinker. I think it would be fair to say. I do too. And and and. And I think one reason that it, it had such a broad appeal that became a pop culture movement was that her incarnation of vampires was distinct from Bram Stoker. Yes, and, <clears throat> and, and I think well overdue, I think it was, it was time. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the Bram Stoker creation is, truly magnificent I, I love the novel and it it have, have obviously heavily influenced I do find it interesting how much vampires in the 20th have impacted the 20th century uh throughout the west um and for people who don't know I'm talking about um Europe and and North America mm -hmm. but and of course there are there are vampire esque myths and uh oh, folkloric uh aspects are, across the world around yeah. the world in cultures of every every kind but the the, the thing that is uh that, that really was time with the, the uh with the publication of the interview with the vampire and then the subsequent uh franchise essentially and uh and genre shift took place in the late 1970s um but we have the thing that overshadows stoker's work is the fact that vampire pop culture vampires were essentially the same for decade after decade after decade after stoker yeah. uh yeah. Anne rice was the one to really shift that up uh, and and move things away from the mm, not only the Stoker mythos but also the Hammer horror films, which which drew heavily from Stoker. Yes, that's true, and made it, to be honest, made it more relatable. Um, yes, <clears throat> people. Um, and, and and. While there was a mystique around the original vampire idea that that Stoker promulgated, um, there there and and certainly uh, just as we're talking about with the Cold War and the albino farm, uh, certain social apprehensions, larger social apprehensions, being involved, uh, Anne Rice really took the 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 vampire idea and shifted it into a uh, very emotional and effective allegory for a variety of people groups and minorities yes yes um and uh and, and by making 
making the monster empathetic, um, it, it uh, opened the door for this, you know, for a imitation culture. Yes, <clears throat> some of which is quite understandable. Some of which is transitioning into, wow, I don't get it. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> categories of a variety of stripes. Zero judgment, just observation. Yeah, yeah but same. Uh, <laughs> something that I and and I love I I love lots and lots of aspects of this. In case anybody mm -hmm. doesn't 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 already get that, but something that I find particularly interesting is the idea that elements of the the vampire cult implication in Springfield predate the pop culture of the late 80s into the 90s. And predate the, the release of Interview with the Vampire, period. Yes. So what do we know about it at this point? Well, the, I mean, there are, there are illusions. And again, part of this, you know, it, it, it could come down to urban legend or maybe not, but, um, tales of basically secret clubs going back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, uh, you know, having some sort of blood ritual, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know um, what all was involved, but it, it's, but enough sort of anecdotal stories come out that there seems to be something of the motif anyway certainly yes. not certainly more probably more influenced by Bram Stoker obviously um and I guess we should say he did not invent vampirism um no. the, the concept of vampires goes back thousands of years but um you know, it's it's one of those things that it's you know sort of uh, usually the anecdotal evidence is uh, you know that so and so related a story that they had heard type thing, but it just seems a, a totally out of place kind of thing, different than what you typically find for the time period, which makes you wonder if there isn't something to it. It does. <clears throat> it does. And of course, it doesn't have to be vampires, but no. certainly odd, uh, odd things happening. Yes, yes. But uh, again, you know, um, centering around, you know, the idea of creatures of the night and, and blood letting type things. Yes. So, it, it it does make you wonder. Um, it does. I don't. I, and I don't necessarily think that one is tied to the other. Um, mm -hmm. That would certainly be interesting if there were a continuity, but I don't necessarily think there are. So, you know, that's something that is certainly noir and goes back a long ways. Well, <laughs> and it it also. Um, <clears throat> easily speaks to is something that is as a general rule is overlooked in terms of and we're talking about downtown Springfield specifically or I am talking about downtown Springfield very specifically mm -hmm. is that there were certain um, difficulties in development of downtown Springfield and that is coming back to the springs and coming back to uh the, the area was originally crisscrossed with uh, with creeks and with wet weather or wet, you know, uh, rain creeks. Right. That it was uh, that those had to be controlled uh, mm -hmm. in order for for urban development to take place and the urban infrastructure. The way to create that is to invest heavily in an extensive drain uh, network beneath downtown yes and that figures in strongly with the vampire culture of the 90s it does yes. not seem to be a part of the stories from the early 1900s 
Um, right. They seem to have you know, the stories are that they would meet various buildings, et cetera. So um, it, it, it's just odd that you, you have sort of two, two variants of vampire culture in the lore of Springfield. Yes. <clears throat> and there, there's, and, and I think this is something that we, we will dedicate additional time and episodes and research to as as we move forward but there's in into 2023 i just realized this is our last yeah this is our our last uh uh episode of 2022 it's that just crossed my mind right now (laughs) (laughs) i've been so focused on notes i didn't bother to look at the calendar but uh, it's been an amazing year dark ozarks has had an amazing year it, it, we really have, and we really want to thank everyone for that too. <laughs> Absolutely, it's. Uh, but I, I'm, you know, there there are a lot of stories, and and even some some pretty credible articles and interesting things that are written just in regards to the um, the tunnel system, the network tunnel system. Yeah. And, but regardless of what's down there, and you can go to, you know, the the two extremes are there's nothing down there you're ridiculous and oh my gosh vampires are real those are the the two extremes um reality typically exists somewhere in the flexible middle but not implying vampires are real i don't think but i used to think the same thing about skinwalkers and uh here we are but um there is something innately creepy about dark tunnel spaces that are difficult and dangerous to access and to uh just to to find out about and and especially i think the the really unnerving part is that these spaces can exist uh directly you know beneath our feet and we we typically have no idea that it's even there right literally a few feet away walk by the openings and a yeah. lot of people would not even know what they're walking past. The idea that that's that's just where the that's just where the rainwater runs. Yep. Yeah, well, th- there's well, a lot down there. Well, you know, of course that evokes you know Stephen King's it. You know, I mean it's you know <laughs> we all float down here. I know. I was I was really thinking about that. You know the the and so many of the of the things that have that evoke folkloric horror. Is, mm-hmm. is the the unseen yes yes and and that that qualifies and not only with the tunnel system but the idea of the the vampire culture whether it's modern day or 100 years ago it is it is and it's it's no wonder regardless of exactly where reality lands it's no wonder that it doesn't that it captures our imagination that's that's very very true um i'm thinking why don't we touch on um the emma malloy story and we may leave the rest for next time i think time wise i think that is is excellent and the the malloy story is tragic juicy Mm mm-hmm tabloid worthy yes and it was tabloid worthy at the time <laughs> yes and very very interesting and of course uh a shout out to uh author larry wood as well for yes. having put a lot of work into uh documenting this history yes and, and larry's a friend of ours um and we've done events with him in the past um and um he has written a a book on on the case um and basically we you have you have a post-civil war outspoken woman who ends up being suckered in by a con man Yes. 
throw in and, a little bigamy and 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 murder and um, falling from grace. <laughs> well, to be fair, it was just a pinch of bigamy. <laughs> just a pinch. <laughs> So I guess we step back and Emma Malloy um, is an interesting character. She, um, she was a newspaper woman at a time that generally women were not yes. just after the Civil War um, mm -hmm. in Indiana, if I remember correctly. Yes. And... Um, had been married and divorced, which was unusual for the time. Yes. Um, she then um, was prominent in the temperance movement. Um, right. And some people may not be familiar with what the temperance movement was. But <laughs> as, no, as well, no alcohol all the time. That's right no liquor anytime and um, and it, it it grew uh variously from religious sectors as well as um social consciousness that perhaps alcohol was not helping some of the social ills of the family in particular um right. And that, that, I think, was, was a primary driver. <clears throat> Alcohol was seen as the, as, as the point of blame mm -hmm. uh, for things like the breakdown of the family, for domestic abuse, uh, for, you know, lots and lots of social ills, and <clears throat> really became a rallying cry at the, the, this, you know, sort of 1880s and <laughs> until prohibition when we found out just how devastating it could be to actually <laughs> enact this on a federal level um, <laughs> welcome to gangsters um uh, and uh and bootlegging but it uh you know i think for a for a long time until the until the repeal of prohibition it it was largely seen as a modernist movement and I, th I think it was really a response to a lot of, uh, of the chaos that came out as societal chaos that came out of the Civil War, uh, trying to address that. Um, uh, a bit misguided, but... Um, their hearts were in the right place. Albeit there you go. Their, their, yes. their methodology. Of course, Carry Nation uh, was the, um, the, the, the true spokesperson for the... <laughs> For the the national movement and uh, she has a strong association with eureka springs history which yes, i find yes, particularly she, ironic well and i and i do find that interesting that you know uh as the scandal broke in springfield as we get into it you know many wanted to say that that she was persecuted by by the area public because she was an independent woman and in the temperance movement, but she was not isolated no. in, in that in that situation. And and we had people like Carrie Nation who were violent in in their in their crusade. Very so, much so. And, and I, I just want to intersect inter, interject on this. Um, I know, for example, uh, having read the rather extensive history of Centerville, Iowa, um, not that long ago, the, the book is massive, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, for example, the, the local temperance movement there, uh, because they felt that, first of all, that they had moral authority and, uh, and societal degree that, that what they were doing was for the greater good. Uh, would regularly initiate violence against the saloons on the south side of town, mm -hmm. and 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 I know that that was not an isolated event. No, and, and Carrie Nation certainly illustrates that. Um, and with Emma Malloy, she she went about things a little differently, um, but she also worked. Um,
my memory here. Um, and um, she really felt that he was being rehabilitated and wanted to give him a chance. Yes, which is very kind. Yes. And what, what, what was Graham's first name? I forget. Do we? Uh, George. George. I couldn't remember George. Um, and George was married to Sarah and had children and had been, they'd been divorced. And so while uh, Miss Malloy gave him a job and so forth, and he uh, became involved with her foster daughter, Coralie. Yes. And, <clears throat> and at first Emma was concerned uh, and about the situation. She went to the extent of verifying that he had been divorced from his wife. Right. What she didn't check on and what she didn't realize was that his wife had remarried him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Minor After, detail. Minor yeah. detail. After he got out of prison, no less. And mm -hmm. so he was married to his wife, who ended up staying in Indiana for a time. And he came, uh, Emma relocated to the Springfield area with yes. her children. And he came along, and shortly after, he and Coralie get married. <clears throat> yes. And then Mrs. Graham, Sarah Graham, has had enough. And so she makes her way to Missouri with her children. Mm -hmm. He meets them in St. Louis. And she's determined that she's going to straighten out this Coralie problem. Yes. And what happens is she, Sarah ends up dead at the bottom of a well on Emma Malloy's property. Correct. And, and is discovered in late February of 1885. Yes, about six months later. And so Graham is arrested, but then they also arrest Emma Malloy and Coralie as accomplices. Yes. <clears throat> and, and Coralie actually goes through two trials before she's acquitted. Mm -hmm. But in between, um, um, Ma breaks Graham out of jail, marches him up Boonville, ostensibly going to take him to the Malloy farm and throw him into the same well. But instead, they hang him. Yes. <clears throat> and, and, as the, and as they're hanging him, he, he, he proclaims that Coralie and Emma have nothing to do with the killing of Sarah. Right, right. Now, at one point, there's also the accusation that he was intimately involved with both. Yes. Um, in terms of, of who precisely did what we we know who ended up dead and <laughs> yes. we know whose body was pulled out of the well uh and we know that george was lynched yes and cora lee seems to have come out after the acquittal rather unscathed and not shunned or blamed uh, right. right. There does seem to have been more um, visitude towards Emma, and she actually never regained her status in the temperance movement. Right. <clears throat> and I think it it's um, at the it, it might be hard for us to you know place into context but 
you know, that 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 Malloy was a a nationally recognized speaker at this yeah. at this juncture, um, and and so and, and a speaker on a on a clearly controversial topic to begin with. So there there was there was plenty of of individuals who um, were her fans. And certainly plenty of people who were her detractors. And so to associate, to, to have, and, and then have this incredibly high profile case that was so scandalous, uh, associated with this person, and not only consequently the person, but the movement, there, it was a big deal. It, it, it really was. Um, and it's, you know, um, as we said, you know, it's, you know, was it was it simply for the fact that that um, it was a means of ending her influence as a temperance uh, activist? It's hard to know because there were quite a few, and and she was pretty tame in that regard compared to many. Um, yeah. <clears throat> although she was a noted speaker, um, I'm sure it did play a play a role, though. Um, yeah, I to me it seems unlikely, and I I, I want to correct make, correct a statement that I, I made just a few moments ago. It was February uh-huh. 1886, 1886, 1985, uh, yeah. that that uh, Sarah Graham's body was found, and uh, the farmstead was near modern day Republic. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't too wasn't wasn't very far from Springfield. And they yeah. they they headed out from the jail on down in downtown uh springfield uh, oh yeah just i mean it they just didn't it's, make it that far no <clears throat> as you know as happens but uh i mean springfield the the reason for them being in the the, the uh, immediate vicinity of republic was because of springfield uh malloy had been invited to come as a speaker and then consequently uh moved onto a farm in, yes, in, in the immediate region. Yeah, liked the area and moved, and um, so you know, I I, th- I think it's I, I it seems to me likely that her detractors did use it. I'm sure mm-hmm. against her, but I, I have to wonder if more of the issue was the facts of the case. Yeah. Than. I- than her role as an activist i i i very much agree with that uh first of all as you noted there uh appears to be uh activists in the movement that were much more vocal um malloy was uh was simply a popular speaker on the subject Mm -hmm. and uh one of her first relationships that ended uh because her her husband drank and was allegedly abusive so she was speaking mm-hmm. from a a point of of personal experience of lived experience in this which i'm sure added a lot to her passion <clears throat> yeah, but I'm sure it did. none none of that um you know has has a has an impact on just how scandalous this case was Yes, I mean it. It really was. It was the combination of all all of the fats. I think that you know, uh, people in the area, I'm sure, you know, were outraged. But candidly, those within the temperance movement probably were legitimately worried that that would overshadow her ability to advance the cause. I'm sure it did. I'm sure. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it did. Uh, whether or not it it diminished the cause, of course, is is up for debate. Um, the fact that we still got prohibition suggests that it didn't do that much. Uh, in no, terms- I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it did. I just. I, I think the fact that her presence in the movement did not um, go back to pre scandal levels was probably more just prudent um, 
moves by the movement saying we, we, we don't, we don't want unnecessary detractions. Um, but by the same token, I don't think her presence in the movement was the basis for her being targeted for the prosecution. No, I, I strongly, strongly agree with that. And, <laughs> you know, to a certain degree, you have to go, look, um, the case presents itself. You, know, you walked, you walked into the quicksand. <laughs> Nobody yeah. dumped the quicksand on you. Uh, yes, if you have blinders on, we can't help that. <laughs> that and while while it seems comparatively unlikely that Malloy was living some sort of scandalous double life, doing all of these nefarious things, uh, what does seem quite reasonable is a level of unpreparedness or naivete in regards to George Graham. Yes, yes. And it, it, so it does make you wonder, you know, how, how much of a con man he was that um, he was able to um, get as far as he did with, with this. So. Right. And I think, you know, just in terms of, of uh, social commentary, there, there, there's two aspects. I suspect that George was pretty good at what he did. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I suspect suspect only um that at some point he had to say wow this is easy pickings because the the so much of the uh the momentum around malloy's efforts was on rehabilitation yeah and she would i think i think she was inadvertently predisposed to want to make him an example of her arguments Oh, I think so. And I think he played into that, certainly. Which now something that is that, that is really um, really, really interesting in regards to uh, the the case, it, particularly in regards to, you know, post uh, lynching. Um, of George, and we should note that that everyone in question, including the person being lynched, in this bit of history, they were all white. Yes, yes. This none of this was race related, as far as I can tell. No. Um, the the leaders of the party artfully gave their followers the slip by starting in the direction of the Malay place, but changed their course as soon as the others turned back. And while yet within the city limits, hanged George to a tree within just one hour after the attack was made on the jail. Uh, <clears throat> this note was penned to the body, quote, we yeah. heartily welcome all strangers to citizenship who are pure of purpose and act of good faith. But we give this as a warning to ex-convicts and murderers who may hereafter invade our county to impose on our credulity. We also give warning that any person or persons of any rank or station who dare to discover the actors in this tragedy will be surely and speedily dispatched to hell where all things are revealed to the curious. In justice to the memory of Sarah Graham, a loving wife, a dear mother, whose life was sacrificed at the altar of Hecate, we subscribe ourselves. And then there was a note to the sheriff as well. Yes. And just as, as we're potentially wrapping up, I find it really interesting that the um, Greco-Roman goddess of crossroads and witchcraft is invoked at the hanging of George <laughs> Brown. Yes, it is rather interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, another bit of noir uh, trivia there. So I, I just want to know if he was hanged at the crossroads now. I am curious. I haven't found uh, I haven't found information of the exact location, which I want to find now. But I uh, too. so and, and and honestly, you can take that from the note that you know basically them saying that maybe George had made a deal with the Crossroads demon, or on the other hand. They had. Right. One, one thing that is objectively obvious about that note from the lynching party 
they were not uneducated. No, that's that's very clear. We yes, that is that is very clear. That 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 might go down in the history of post mortem uh, pinned to one shirt commentary after a lynching uh, of being the most eloquent to go down in history. I don't know. I haven't compared any others, but. Just I don't know. Take it, it it, it, you know, it has a Shakespearean twist to it. It really does. <laughs> yes. it does. Uh, wow. But you know, uh, reference to Hecate. I I really I'm I'm now obsessed about this case. Yes. <laughs> and perhaps that is a good point to leave off at. Yes. And we will be visiting much more of Dark Tales of Springfield. In the yes. meantime, don't forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. Thank you again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping bring the Dark Ozarts to everyone. On the next episode, we're going to be discussing guess what? More dark tales from the Queen City of the Ozarks, Springfield, Missouri, including The Missing Three and more. Catch the Dark Ozarks podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other podcast platforms. And thank you to everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks. <laughs>